Nuked Radio. This is episode 70. Today is Tuesday, November the 6th, 2012. It's election day in America. I am your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Jules and special guest today, Jeff Wefferson, author of the lovely nuclear blog, Rachel Carlson's of Today. There's something else that Jeff is infamous for, though, and we'll get to that story in a moment. Two big news items today. This is being reported on NOAA's incident news. There was a wellhead release in the Gulf of Mexico at 6.40 yesterday. Sector in New Orleans contacted NOAA about a report of a wellhead releasing unknown product into the water. The location was described as the northern East Bay without precise coordinates. The release began early in the morning. The exact time is unknown, and the rate of discharge is unknown. The release is not secured yet. Overflight was scheduled. At the time of this posting, the Coast Guard had not even been to the site. An update today is stating that it is an oil spill. Now, this will be somewhere in the area between the Gulf of Mexico Mercando well site and the city of New Orleans. We talked about Reed Simmons' theory, and I'm still working on getting Wikipedia to accept that as an article. Another story, though, that we needed to also make sure we talked about was what was posted on any news yesterday what is going on at Daiichi Fukushima fallout increased November 2nd through 4th the highest in back-to-back -back days in months and there's some charts posted there so there's been a significant cesium increase no further information is available but how do we really know what's going on at the plant we rely on information from TEPCO that's been manipulated and underreported we rely on cameras and photographs that by TEPCO's own emissions have been tampered with in the past. We rely on local reports, rad readings, weather patterns, networks, all which are prone to misinterpretation. So how do we really know that when we see images of the inside of reactor number four spent fuel pool that it isn't reactor five or six? We don't. The only way that you could really know is if you walked up to the spent fuel pool and you looked inside of it for yourself. So two weeks ago, when a blogger posted the spent fuel pool was on fire, many Fukushima followers and others became understandably alarmed. Could this be the start of a chain reaction extinction level event? After a long day, it was determined by many researchers that this article was a hoax, but how do we really know? When I found out that Jeff Wefferson was behind this post, knowing him, his dedication, his insightfulness, I knew that there had to be more to this story, and I was interested in finding out why he posted this, which led me to his blog, with the following update. Fukushima and beyond, the global nuclear scenario is no hoax. I'm not apologizing for disseminating what appears to be inaccurate reports about the spent fuel pools at Fukushima, and anyone criticizing me is totally missing the point about the whole thing. Few people are able, even able to grasp the real nature of what has already been happening since the whole Fukushima thing started last year, and what the existence of all things nuclear actually means for life on this planet. Now, Jeff got up very early today to join us on this show. I'd like him to explain his position and the reasons behind his post. Jeff, welcome to Nuked Radio. Oh, oh, I, I should wake up. It's four in the morning here, Christina. Thank you so much for having me on here, and, um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, before we get into this story further, you have some pretty heavy credentials, and we could probably spend the whole hour discussing them and your experience, and can you just tell us what your background and education is briefly? Well, uh, technically I have no credentials in, in the, the true official sense. I, I don't actually have a degree from college, but I went to college at a major science and technical university in the South. I started out as a physics major, and then I went into zoology and psychology. Yeah, I, I was first going to be an astronomer, but when I learned that astronomers don't actually look at the stars, they do math and work with computers, I went like, uh, I don't want to do that. And I became really interested in the brain and mind. And um, a very major influence on me has been uh, a scientist named Dr. John C. Lilly, whose work I became familiar with uh, whenever I was in college. And I ended up 
going to college for three and a half years, and um, I, I studied basic science, which I've always been very, very, very grateful for. And before college, I was like the science nerd in high school. I was first in my class and made all A's and you know, was the, the sort of science nerd type of guy. But uh, I, I ended up quitting college, but that's when my real education began. I decided that uh, I was interested in understanding reality and what it means to be human beings in the universe and on, on this planet. But I, I was not interested in, in formal academia, but my process of self-education really began. Uh, I moved to California and got involved with Dr. Lilly's Dolphin Communication Group, which has been my single most important ongoing project to this day. But all along, I've pursued what, to me, was the most important areas of understanding and research that relate to what it means to be a human being on this planet, to the effects that human activity is having on our planet and all the other forms of life. But being having the, the perspective of an astronomer, which is another um, thing that, that, that led me to really appreciate the work of Dr. Carl Sagan, who I got to meet once at a, a radio telescope installation in 1992. Um, being an astronomer, you know who he was. He was the, the guy that, that did the uh, the Cosmos TV series back in the late 70s and really right. turned a lot of people on to the stars. But um, he was an astronomer, and he had this cosmic perspective about how big the universe is and how small we are and how briefly we've been here in the sort of cosmic time scale of things. It's like we're this complete anomaly. But as an astronomer... That made him acutely aware of the danger that we're creating uh, to, to uh, I mean, in total honesty, with all the other planets that we think might be out there and stuff. Now, if you really want to talk about a level of abstraction that you don't really know if it's really there, look at the whole world of, of modern astronomy. I mean, we, we assume that there's all these galaxies and planets and stuff floating around out there, but we haven't been there. And so at, at least things on the Earth, you've got the potential to walk over there and look at this Fukushima spent fuel pool if you, if you dare or if you can get there. But this kind of thing is even another level of abstraction. But Sagan realized that th this is the only planet we know that has life. And, and he started looking at the danger posed by the nu nuclear scenario. He became a very, very, very outspoken anti-nuclear activist and went and personally demonstrated at what was then called the Nevada test site over 100 times and he came down in the early 90s he came down with a uh, if I move back a little bit will that be okay for the sound of my voice yeah I, I hear a little bit of buzzing I mean I know we're on a, a tenuous connection so to speak but it's better now is that okay yeah back but anyway Carl Sagan came down with a very rare form of leukemia and died from it in 1996. Um, and I, most people think that he probably got that leukemia because of uh, of his demonstrations at the Nevada test site. But uh, anyway, my, my whole thing has been um, to pursue, to try to educate myself uh, as deeply and broadly as possible about things that really matter. There's so many things that people concern themselves with that, that, that in the grand scheme, they don't matter. At the end of the day, when your life is over and you look back and you go, like, what did I do with my life? You go, like, most people could go, like, wow, I watched a lot of television. I drank a lot of beer. I went to a lot of parties. I drove a light year of miles. But what did I actually do? What did I actually accomplish? Um, what kind of difference did I make as a human being? So I've tried to focus on what I think is important. I've tried to always educate myself, not only through reading and you know standard forms of, of learning but also through trying to create and establish and constantly upgrade a network of like-minded people um, that are working on areas that really matter and so I've, I've constantly tried to actually get in touch with people around the world that are doing research whose work means a lot to me and who I think are honest credible people that, that don't have a hidden agenda or that don't work for some kind of institution. Um, some of them might be academic people, but a lot of them are independent researchers. For example, um, Lorraine Murray, who you know pretty well, um, she's someone I have an immense amount of respect for in terms of, of what she's doing. 
but that that's basically my background. So I, I don't have any formal credentials, but in a way that's really good because I've probably got, I mean, honest to God, I've probably got the equivalent knowledge that's more meaningful than probably the PhD level in several different areas. Um, for example, my, my work in uh, the psychology of mass communication um, led to me creating a website called regainyourbrain.org and the blog spot by the same name. It's all about the, the nature of what we think of as reality, how we get our information upon which we build our personal reality and the, the nature of, of what I call second order information, which is anything that, that we take to be true that is not from the domain of our own personal experience, which is just about everything. Um, including Fukushima, like, I mean, how many people have ever actually seen an atomic bomb explosion? How many people have ever actually seen Obama in person? Or, I mean, it, it, you can see my point. If, if you haven't been there, seen there, seen it, and done it yourself, you're taking it on somebody's word, like all the stuff in the Bible, for example. The whole, and, like, everything. Like all the stuff going on at Fukushima. Everything, and, I mean... If, Fukushima was not your your first adventure either in a nuclear disaster. You had kind of an interesting story you shared with me about what you were doing when Chernobyl happened. Should I should I tell that really briefly? Sure. <laughs> this is one of the most profound and freaky synchronicities of my whole life, and this is sort of what uh, put me at the the red alert level of the whole global nuclear scenario. Uh, I was in California in 1986 hanging out with my friends in Santa Cruz, and uh, I learned about this uh, thing called the Big Mountain Support Group. Big Mountain is a, a part of northern Arizona, which is uh, sort of the, near the joint use area of the Hopi and the Navajo. And uh, they were it was a group of people who were going to go there and, in support of these indigenous elders who were going to be relocated by these mining companies because they wanted to mine their land. So we went up there. And uh, this was uh, April of 1986, and we were up there. We, we learned about the Hopi prophecies upon which the film Koyana Skatsi was made. These are prophecies that, that go back many, many, many thousands of years that were passed down from the Hopi elders, and they were warnings about what they call the Day of Purification. We learned about all this. I um, borrowed a Geiger counter from the physics department at UC Santa Cruz. I was walking around taking readings on the rocks. Um, an F-111 fighter plane flew over at about 100 feet high and, and scared the shit out of all of us. Um, we learned about that uh, some of the uranium for the first atomic bombs was mined from there, a place called Black Mesa. Um, this, is, uh, this is a company called Peabody Coal that was the parent company of Carr McGee, the company that Karen Silkwood worked for. You might have seen that movie, Silkwood, about the, oh, yeah. the, the woman. That's a true story. She worked at the Carmagee Plutonium repro Reprocessing Facility and uh, found out that they were all getting contaminated with it and, and it was leaking and stuff, and, and she actually was killed on the way to meet uh, a journalist with all this evidence and stuff. That's a true story. We learned about all that. Anyway, we were up there learning this really, really heavy stuff, and um, we were out of media touch for a week, and we came down to Flagstaff a week later, and I saw the, the largest headline that it's possible to have on the newspaper. The Chernobyl meltdown had happened while we were up there walking around learning about all this stuff. And I went, oh, my God, that is just one of the freakiest synchronicities I've ever experienced. And ever since then, it's like been, been one of the a big part of my mission as a human being and someone with enough scientific background to sort of understand some of this stuff um, to keep the global nuclear scenario on the radar of public consciousness and uh, a lot of people just don't want to hear about it it's such an abstract thing I mean the whole thing with, with ionizing radiation it's totally invisible imperceptible to our senses um, you can even be you could be getting nuked by enough that would kill you in a few hours and you, and you won't feel it you just you know we're, it, it, we're not designed to perceive it so that it makes it uh, all the more dangerous um, to be. It, I mean, if, if if someone's holding a gun to your head or pointing a gun at you, you you have a sense of danger. As as, as a biological organism, we're able to sense that. But with all this 
not just the nuclear thing, but many, many other forms of modern technological advancement, chemicals, genetic engineering, all this stuff, I mean, we don't perceive it. We're, we're being affected by it, but we, we don't perceive it. And uh, Sagan noted that it's a great irony of the day that, that almost everybody on the planet is immensely affected by all many, many forms of advanced technology, yet the vast majority of people don't even have the most rudimentary scientific understanding in order to make sense out of any of this, or, for example, to understand why it's dangerous, why ionizing radiation is dangerous to life as we know it. And uh, not that anyone fully understands, but, but the people going back to the Manhattan Project and before, they've known all along exactly how dangerous it is. Well, we, we've been trying to understand and we've been trying to recruit as many smart people along the way to help us with this. And the hope is that you know one of these days somebody who, who does have a, a position of power or authority will get into this discussion and will contribute to where it is brought on more people's radar, so to speak. And, and Jeff, I ask everyone who's a guest on the show, when did you first learn about Fukushima? You know, what were you doing when it happened? And when did you realize we were in big trouble? But knowing you now and knowing your work, I think I already know how you'll answer that. We've been in trouble since 1945. Well, even before. But yes, I think that um, that's another... Let me just go back and, and, and clear this before we move on. That, that whole thing from a couple of weeks ago, um, it, was, it was not a hoax. Hoax implies that it was deliberate or that there was an element of malice to it or anything like that. That's not the case at all, at least not, not, from what, not anything that I understand. I didn't actually make this story up. Uh, I, I, I basically um, – there's a guy on Facebook who you know. His name is Troy Livingston, and he has a Facebook page under his name. And he, he, he's been a pretty good source of, uh, of reality-based, I think, reasonably credible information about Fukushima. Um, ever since it happened. And so on his page one day, I was just sort of looking, and, and I saw this guy named Michael Eckstein, and he was talking about that he lived near Fukushima, that he, that he had seen smoke coming out, and that he thought that the spent fuel pools were on fire and stuff like that. And so I, I messaged him, and he started telling me all this stuff about how the spent fuel pools were on fire and that there was a... Um, that, 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 people were, they, that people were being told to stay in their house and and all this stuff, and, and uh, I started, I tried to, um, to verify with Troy, and Troy said yeah, that there was some kind of fire, but he thought it was a grass fire or something like that, and, um, but this was unfolding pretty quickly, and, and I, I somehow trusted this guy because he, he apparently had been a friend of Troy's for a long time, and I went like, I, I ran it over in my mind, and I went like, you know, if this dude's a, 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 an eyewitness sitting there watching this shit happen right now, if this is really real, the people should know about it as quickly as possible because they're, you know, that that was my line of reasoning, and it was probably, I probably acted a little too quickly, and so, uh, and, and then I, I emailed Michael several times. I've got all these emails I can show you, and he started saying stuff like, uh, um, oh yeah, there's a mass panic at the airport, and everybody's trying to buy buy groceries and stuff like that, and and so that that's when I should have really paused before I passed it all on. But no, I went like, well, you know, better safe than sorry. That's what I thought. Better safe than sorry. So I, I sent out that, that first message. And um but it was not it was not a hoax. It was uh it, it was inaccurate information. Well it may not even be inaccurate. Now you've got to listen to this. I've heard from many people since then, people that were there and apparently even as of yesterday I learned that around that time there were plumes of smoke coming out of some of the reactors that people saw. And then there was also a massive uh, radiation spike that was on about the uh, uh, a couple of days before. I, I can't remember the exact date of this. I think it was like the 22nd or something like that of October. But uh, the, uh, the bottom line is we don't really know. I mean, I, I think that Michael Eckstein greatly over-exaggerated all that stuff. And I, I don't know this dude... Um, Troy reckons that he's somebody that used to be credible, that his maybe his brain's gone a little kooky from living near Fukushima for too long. And I don't think, I don't know, I, I, I don't think he was deliberately trying to create a big hoax or anything. But then, but then later on when I tried to, to pressure him to tell me exactly what was going on, 
he uh, then he made up some story that someone had had hacked into his Facebook account and sent sent some of those messages somebody, that somebody else had done it. So I think that the dude's just a little kooky. But the bottom line is, none of us really know what's going on there. Just, apparently, Alex Jones and Infowars made a big deal out of this hoax bullshit. And, and uh, I went like, dude, so you went there yourself and looked in there, and that's how you know that there was no fire. But, but no, Alex Jones has never been to Fukushima. And all these people were all totally reliant on information, many orders of magnitude removed from our own personal experience. All of our reality is like that, um, and it, it's really actually quite a dangerous and mentally unhealthy position for us all to be in, that we take so much of this second-order information and we act as if it's true without even, I mean, you've got to sort of act as if a lot of it's true, but, but you, can, you can question it. You can question this process of how we get all this information, but another really big thing to be aware of is that this process that we're talking about of how reliant we are on information that, that's not from our own life. The powers that be that want to control us have been have been, become masters of manipulating this process for many, many, many decades. This is probably the biggest weapon system in use is that of the control of information, the control of communication, um, what you might loosely call a whole paradigm of psychological warfare based on not only manipulating language, but manipulating what other people think of as reality, um, preying on people's gullibility, the, the tendency of the public to trust people in authority, and they really shouldn't. Um, it's, a, it's a science that I've gone into great detail to describe in my Regain Your Brain website. And this whole thing ever since Fukushima has been um, a textbook example of every propaganda and public relations trick that can be rolled out to, to use. Um, Ace Hoffman, who is a really brilliant uh, nuclear awareness person, uh, he, he makes the point in his brilliant book called The Code Killers, which you can download for free from his site, acehoffman.org. Um, he says that the, the biggest thing about the whole nuclear industry is the amount of lies that have gone along with it from day one. Uh, I always thought it was very interesting that, uh, and, and what I'm telling you now is documented in a brilliant book. It's called The Perfect Machine, Television in the Nuclear Age by a woman named Joyce Nelson. I think she's Canadian. She documents how the company called General Electric simultaneously came out with the earliest nuclear reactors. They were also making the uh, atomic weapons and stuff. They simultaneously came out with nuclear reactors and television. At the same time, they were both considered to be weapon systems. Television was referred to as the atomic bomb of the mind. And the earliest use of television was to create public, to manufacture consent in the public mind for the peaceful existence of nuclear weapons and what, um, what they called the peaceful atom. That's, that was what television was originally designed to do and also manufacture consent for the Cold War. So all along, we've been living in, in an age of unreality where we, we've been conditioned to uncritically assimilate anything that comes to us through mass media, and we, we really shouldn't. And Fukushima's been a, a great example of that. But this thing from a couple of weeks ago was not a hoax, uh, at least not on my part. Um, but the bottom line is it got Fukushima back on everybody's radar, um, it, it, everybody had sort of got a presidential election uh, distraction fever, and there's probably a lot of that going on today, but it doesn't matter who the president is. As, as I see it, who the president of America is has not mattered since JFK. He was the last real president that we had. Everyone since then has been a puppet that was installed. And so now it's just, it's all an act. It's a sh an act that if they quit having the election, people would freak out. B but it doesn't matter. So it, it doesn't really matter who you vote for. The same the same stuff's going to unroll anyway. But uh, this was not a hoax. It got Fukushima back on people's radar. Um, the bottom line is people should be thankful that the spent fuel pool didn't collapse yet and didn't catch on fire, although it is documented that 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 spent fuel pool has been on fire before. And people don't realize how 
dangerous all this stuff is. It's way, way, way dangerous. You can't even have enough zeros on the amount of radiation that's come out, the plutonium. Um, the, the, the bottom line is the real red alert level with Fukushima happened in the very first two or three days when Reactor 3 exploded and sent these MOX fuel rods three kilometers away, fragments of, of, of fuel rod that, that might have been spent fuel rods or reactor rods. Um, even Arnie Gunderson talks about this. Um, this is We're talking about a massive, massive, massive release of plutonium that's never happened before. It didn't happen with Chernobyl. Chernobyl did not have um, MOX fuel, although any spent fuel rods do have plutonium that's created in there. So uh, the, the red alert, if you want to call it a mass extinction level event, that happened the first week of Fukushima. Also, I think, and again, this, this is, you, you don't know without going there, um, and you certainly can't trust all the, the TEPCO cameras and all this stuff, um, but logically to me, logic is how you have to approach a lot of this stuff. Purely logically, say like with building number three, if the explosion, which Chris Busby, who was another extremely trustworthy, credible source of information, uh, I believe he's a physical chemist by profession, who's a... a, a nuclear guy, very, very good person. He's my friend on Facebook. He, he observed back then that that explosion was not a hydrogen explosion. It was actually an atomic explosion. And so when you look at, at the, uh, the design of these Mark IV reactors, which were designed by General Electric, um, they put the spent fuel pool on top of the reactor. I mean, why would they do that? It's on top of the reactor. And so, look, if this reactor blew up with an atomic explosion so powerful that it shot fuel rods three kilometers away, what's the probability that that spent fuel pool is still sitting there with water in it? I'd say zero. I mean, I've, I've seen articles. Another good source of information is uh, any news, you know, ene.com news. They're, they're good. Um, they have a lot of good stuff. But, but, I mean, I can show you articles where they're talking about all these Japanese scientists are saying that, that the spent fuel pool blew up and, and, and it shattered all these rods and stuff. And see, that right there, Ace Hoffman will tell you, a spent fuel pool accident is astronomically more dangerous than a meltdown. But with Fukushima, we've got many, many meltdowns, probably, I mean, at least three or four, maybe six. I mean, we, we just don't know. We don't know. When you look at how many reactors are there, um, what the possibilities are, and so to, to try to, to, to formulate what's really gone on, I mean, you've got to look at the total amount of nuclear material that was there, which could be an estimate could be made based on the type of reactors, how many fuel rods are in them at each time, uh, how much unused fuel is on site, how many spent fuel rods are there, and how many pulls and all this. And so you could figure out the total amount of, of radioactive stuff that's there, and then, and then you could then you, you, you could go, well, the worst case scenario is that every single last curie of it got released and then worked backwards from there. But, I mean, there's so many unknowns. Like Chernobyl was a relatively simple event compared to this. It was one reactor that blew up, or I, I actually think that it was actually blown up on purpose. When you look at the chain of events with what happened with Chernobyl, the reason it happened was they were um, running a test at night when all the primary crew were gone and what happened was there was a, a loss at, at this critical moment when they were running this test the communication line dropped out between the guy in the control room and the guy at the reactor and that led to some kind of confusion and that that's what actually created the whole thing you know I interviewed Chris Busby a couple months ago and he actually Did brought you? that up that he felt that Chernobyl might have been done on purpose and I asked him about whether or not he thought Fukushima was done on purpose. Yes. Well, when you look at, 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 the, at the, uh, a grand strategy behind this stuff, um, if you look at wh where Chernobyl was and what, what it did, see, they would have known ahead of time what the wind dispersal patterns were going to be from it when they did it and all this stuff. What it did was it contaminated the Ukraine, which is the breadbasket of, of Russia. It was the single biggest way See, I, I look at this stuff, like Lauren Murray sort of got me thinking in this kind of way, but uh, th these, these have, um, it's a form of, of nuclear war that's being waged, but without missiles and stuff. It's actually, uh, 
I think that these things were engineered in order to to um, it's part of a, a, a large ongoing uh, agenda to depopulate the world through the dispersal of these radioactive compounds. That's what Lorraine Murray said. And when you go back to what she um, she first told me about, it's called the Groves, Memorand Mo Groves Memorandum. Leslie Groves was the director of the Manhattan Project. There's a, a, a memorandum where these scientists recommend that they can th – that um, – all this nuclear waste is going to be being created from these reactors and shit. And they go like, well, why don't we just take it and spread it like cow manure on the field? And that will permanently contaminate everybody's land. I mean, they, they wrote about doing that. So that, that was sort of the origin of the whole idea of uh, depleted uranium. And how that, that's another whole story in itself. We, keeping that on people's radar all through, you know, up until the, the Fukushima thing. But... Uh, I think that there's a, uh, evidence that, that the Chernobyl thing was done on purpose. Obviously, Fukushima. Now, again, that, there's another whole area to talk about, the, the whole new generation of high-tech weapons based on microwaves and Tesla technology, uh, of which HARP is just one example. There would be many, many dozens of, of installations like these around the world. This whole new weapon system has rendered nuclear weapons obsolete except as biological weapons to disperse the radioactive compounds around to uh and see again when what they're actually doing is this kind of thing these carcinogens and mutagens they're it's not like just shooting somebody and killing them what they're actually doing this is how diabolical it is it's the human genome is being targeted that they want to they don't want to just kill the people they want to make people impossible I mean, I think I think that's actually the, the mentality behind it. Uh, it's insane, and it, I'm not an insider on any of this, and I never will be, and I don't want to be. But just mapping it from the outside, there's got to be these levels of insanity. I mean, why build nuclear reactors on major fault lines and then put the spent fuel pool right on top of it? And then when you look at how many reactors there actually are in the world, um, the 400 and something figure is probably less than half of what there really is. Uh, I'm always making it a point. I mean, a lot of this is stuff. I'm explain, just saying, explain that for people who don't know. What? Of where all the other nuclear reactors well, are. Well, I learned just recently, a few months ago, that if, <laughs> the U.S. Navy has hundreds of reactors of their own in submarines and ships for research and development for weapons and stuff like that. I mean, hundreds. Uh, um, the, the, the U.S. Navy has more reactors probably than all of Western Europe uh, alone. And then the, the Russian Navy, um, other navies, Britain, France, um, China, uh, they say 400 and some reactors, but those are just um, civilian power reactors. There's all these ones for research and development, and, there, and there's, there's reactors that aren't just fission reactors. There's, I mean, there's all kind of weird shit. I have no way of knowing. What, I mean, people, even people just in academic circles, if they had the time, could figure all this stuff out. But, but the more I've learned, it, it's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable how much of this shit is out there, how many reactors there are. Every single reactor, I mean, I, 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 think, I don't think it's an overestimate to say that there's probably a thousand nuclear reactors. Um, and there, there may be less, there may be more. But I, I, it's not 400. It's, it's, it's easily twice that many. Um, every single one uses an extremely large amount of nuclear fuel that has to be constantly replenished. Um, it's got nuclear fuel in it. The reactor itself is extremely radioactive and everything associated with it. And then it's got the, the immense amount of spent fuel rods that come out that have to be stored probably underwater. Um, and these, ironically, this is another <clears throat> sort of um, paradox of the whole nuclear thing. These spent fuel rods, when they come out of the reactor, they're much more highly radioactive than when they went in. Now, figure that out. And so, I mean, I, mean, I can point you to a reference. There's a really good book called Hot Legacy by uh, a guy named Weissman. And there's a chapter in there where he talks about all this. But... Uh, so the, and this stuff comes out of the reactor, and it's, it's got plutonium that was created as the, in the fission process. And then we've got to store all the shit, 
Every reactor has its own storage facility because there's nowhere to put it, absolutely nowhere to put it. And so uh, they, they, they think it's contained, but it's all, I mean, every, re I think Lorraine Murray will tell you, and Chris Busby, every reactor not only is legally allowed to vent radiation, but it leaks and they dispose of shit and stuff in ways that no one knows about and th that possibly that they don't even know about. Every reactor, like look at Sellafield which used to be called Windmere, I think. They changed the name for some reason, but that's it's completely contaminated the whole Irish Sea. Chris Busby is like an expert on that. But uh, every if you look at every reactor around the world, it's going to be leaking radiation. It's a massive um, storage facility for the highest, the most dangerous stuff that we know that exists. The, the, all this radioactive shit, it exists in nature, but it comes from like supernovas and stuff. And so um, all the radioactive elements down in the ground, they're, they're the body of the Earth, and they, they have a function when they're down in there. And uranium, I mean, it's natural. And there's trace elements of uranium in topsoil everywhere around the world, but at minuscule levels. And this is natural uranium. So th th that's, see, you can't say radiation is bad because it's not. And then, again, radiation is a very complex thing. You've got ionizing radiation, which is what we have from nuclear stuff, of which there's several different kinds, alpha, beta, gamma, decay. But then there's non-ionizing radiation, which is not so energetic. But radiation, the electromagnetic radiation from the sun, <laughs> without that, we wouldn't exist. I mean, that's really what we're made of. We're sort of like condensed light that, that's actually slowed down and crystallized. And that, that's what physical matter is and, and uh, life and stuff like that. Plants. Plants are, to me, it may be possible that plants are actually a higher form of life than animals. They're much older. They're actually autotrophic. Plants are able to actually ingest sunlight and in con conjunction with molecules from the soil and water, they're able to manufacture their own food. We can't do that. We have to eat something else. We're heterotrophs. And I, I think that we've got it backwards. I think that, that, that plants may be higher, a higher form of life than us because they're 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 able to uh, they have a, a, a much more uh, harmonious relationship with light, but light is a form of radiation. So without you can't say radiation is bad, but it's when we start digging all this stuff out of the ground, we mobilize it, we concentrate it, and we we do all this stuff to it. That's when it becomes dangerous. And that uh that um so I think that there's over probably a thousand reactors. Every one of them probably has spent fuel pools. Um, the reactors themselves, and, and another thing is, people go like, "Oh yeah, well, let, if we let's just let's let's shut it all down. Let's sh shut down the reactors, and then we'll be okay." <laughs> no way. Even if they shut them all down tomorrow, all the shit's still going to be there for millions of years. And uh, another thing is, people go like, "Oh yeah, well, let's disarm all the nuclear weapons, and then we'll be safe." That's fucking bullshit too, because <laughs> all the radioactive shit's still going to be there. What are we going to do with it? Well, for a long time, we just dumped it in the ocean. <clears throat> in fact, 45 to 50 years ago, that was an acceptable practice. But now, a lot of those barrels and containers that this nuclear waste was put into, and it was you know, dumped into the ocean off El Hero and in the Arctic Sea by Russia, and I mean, we even have Very it in long. the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, those containers are all reaching their life expectancy and when people have put cameras down there, divers have gone down to look at what they're doing on the ocean floor. A lot of these barrels are already open, rusted yes. through. This is just a few that we know about. Imagine how much shit's been dumped in the ocean that we don't know about. Imagine Where do you reckon the, the Navy dumps their shit? They wouldn't put it in the ocean, would they? Well, I know they've sunk a few subs in the Atlantic. I know, but I, what I'm saying is that they would obviously do that. How would anybody know? I mean, the amount of stuff that's gone into the ocean, the ocean's been treated like a giant sewer for hundreds of years. And people, it's just so big, they go like, oh, even scientists now, like this, this moron named Ken Busler that works for Woods Hole. Woods Hole is a subsidiary of the U.S. Navy, just like Scripps Institute, just like the NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the National Marine Fishery Service. These are organizations that are owned and controlled by the U.S. Navy. They, there's, NOAA is supposed to provide oversight 
and grant the Navy environmental impact statements and all this stuff. But, but they, you know, right now they're just giving the Navy, NOAA is giving the Navy an official permit to legally kill tens of millions of marine mammals. So what does that tell you? Um, but, but the Navy's the biggest nuclear entity on the planet. Does the U.S. Navy also run the HARP program? They do. They're, they're the, the primary owner and operator of it, along with the Air Force. Um, they, if you start looking at the amount of research that the Office of Naval Research does uh, towards these advanced weapon systems and stuff, I mean, I've just looked into it a little bit. It's absolutely fucking mind-blowing, the stuff that they're working on. They, they, because they've got an infinite amount of money, like probably every university on the planet, has military, has contracts with the Pentagon and stuff like that. But the Navy, the Navy is involved in all the shit. They're the, uh, they're the primary owner-operator of HARP, but, but in, 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 involved in uh, the, the development of weapon systems that are way beyond that. Um, they also control what a lot of people would agree is at least between 90 and 98 percent of all marine biology research on the planet is people working for the Navy. So uh, uh, there, there's two things that they do. They're able to weaponize everything, including the whales and dolphins and, and stuff like that, which has been going on for decades. But they also, uh, when it comes time for the, a, a lot of it's public relations, all these, there's been a whole rash of absolute bullshit quasi pseudo-scientific stuff coming out lately about the whales and dolphins from all these people that work for the Navy and stuff like that. And it's, ab oh my God, it's just absolutely sick. So, um, and the Navy's just one aspect of the U.S. military. But um, it's pretty much, I've got to say this, that um, a lot of this stuff, people go like, oh, 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 that's just some conspiracy theory. And uh, I was on a, a radio show a few months ago called Vinny Eastwood. And uh, the very first thing I started to talk about on there was, I go like, dude, do you know where what the word conspiracy really means? I go like, it, uh, it comes from the Latin word conspirare, that means to breathe together. So co-conspirators are people that are breathing together, which is all of us. Anybody that's an aerobic life form breathing oxygen, we're co-conspirators here in the web of life. But I think it goes back to like the ancient Greeks. If you were conspiring people were back there they were like whispering together back in the corner you know about what they were going to do and stuff like that so conspiracy theory is something that really sort of became big in the wake of 9-11 and uh and so it's it's sort of a catch-all category for stuff that people don't want to think might really be true but i think uh and, and sure there is a lot of bullshit out there i think that's another part of the psychological operation thing that's gone on is that, that the, the powers that be that want that to that, that, that fuck with what, what people think, they're sort of behind a lot of the bullshit too. They've got people that'll just spew out anything. You know, uh, I, Let me just say this. There's a book called The Stargate Conspiracy. I forget the authors. I haven't actually read it, but I've heard about it. But it, it's, an, it, it's a look at a lot of the sort of new age stuff that people have held to be true. Uh, and, and it actually came from a psychological warfare project that was part of this thing called MK Ultra that the CIA was running. Uh, and what Which they was were another conspiracy to, that was proven to be true. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we only know the tip of the iceberg. They go like, "Oh yeah, yeah, we did that, but we quit." No, 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 no. But uh, when you, I mean, just look. Turn on a TV. Turn on a TV and tell me what you think. Is that it's like a wall of of of, uh, of toxic cess coming at you? But uh, anyway, but, but the, what they were trying to do with this certain project, they were trying to determine what the limits were of the most unbelievable bullshit that people could be induced to believe as true. Like they were just making up the most absurd shit. And, 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 and passing it off, and, and, the, and what they found was that there was no limit. They, they found that there was no limit to what people could be induced to accept as reality, which is really scary. And you see, I mean, oh my God, I mean, look, look at, at the uh, Obama presidency. Like, um, look, look at the, the reaction when Fukushima happened. I mean, we, we were talking yesterday about how, I only learned this months later, just so happened that right when 
right before Fukushima happened, Obama was in Brazil for two weeks meeting with the heads of Westinghouse, General Electric, some other corporations. Oh, he was also with um, this guy named Hackett, who is the CEO of Anadarko Petroleum, who's a, a really weird company, an oil company based in Texas. But five of their board members have direct connections with HARP. They were all together along with Madeleine Albright uh, in Brazil for two weeks when Fukushima happened. And uh, I think that uh, Lorraine Murray was talking about how well they were down there. A lot of people were down there because they knew that that's when the first, the big massive radioactive plumes from Fukushima were going to be covering North America. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting uh, time to take a vacation there. And, and his kids were down there too and his wife, Obama's yes. kids and wife. So people go like, but Jeff, who would do this stuff? Who would release all this radiation on purpose and kill all these people? Wouldn't it? Would, it would endanger them too, wouldn't it? And I go like, well, you'd think so. Um, and, and I'm I'm not a fan of David Icke. David Icke, you know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, sometimes he appears to be saying s stuff that's cool. But but you go back to his original thing that, that made him famous. It's this whole reptile being thing that these people aren't actually people. They're these lizard people from space or something like that. And I don't buy that shit, man. I think it's just that I think he's part of a psychological warfare thing. I don't either. Along. I like everything else that he talks about, but not that. I just can't but that, but support that. That's the underlying premise of all his stuff. Yeah. You've got to understand that. And so uh, the reptile beings, I don't believe, but, but, but I do think that a lot of these aristocratic people uh, that are in these power elite families, the ones that are that Alex Jones loves to talk about so much, that they that they probably do have a lot of delusions about themselves. They they might actually think that their genetic code is superior, so the radiation is not going to hurt them. Um, they might also have access to extremely advanced pharmaceutical drugs that have been made that that that, that they say is going to protect people from radiation and stuff like that. Um, I mean, you, you, that would have to be the case, that the ultra-rich people would have the same people that are buying into uh, Ray Kurzweil's research on becoming transhuman. That's another thing that this, this is, I mean, this is absolutely fucking insane that we've gone this far, that there's people that, that are walking around talking about that they're going to live forever because they're going to gradually turn themselves into something that's not human anymore through nanotechnology and genetic engineering and robotics, that's exactly what Ray Kurzweil is talking about, that he's like not some kook, I mean he is, but that he's like a visionary for all these New World Order people. So they're going like, well hell, by the time the radiation's too high, I won't be a person anymore, I'll be a transhuman and we can actually eat some radiation. You know, the New World Order was one of those things on the list that people always thought was a conspiracy that turned out to be true, Watergate. Uh, the oh. Tuskegee syphilis study, asbestos, oh. and, the, and it's a cancer-causing ability, the Manhattan Project, the mafia. They've known all along. If, 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 this is just the tip of the iceberg, what we found out. The people, they, they know what this shit does all along. And the, the one paradigm that sort of makes sense out of all of it is the, uh, an agenda of, of deliberate depopulation. And uh, I'll recommend people, uh, I told you about it yesterday, I sent you that link. Um, and again, for anyone who's interested, um, I'm not sure how you, when you put these radio shows up onto your YouTube, if there's any visuals that goes along with it. But uh, if Sometimes. there is, if there is, I can send you a whole bunch of links to a lot of these articles, posts that I've written, and articles um, that that, re that that back up all the stuff that I'm talking about. But but right now, there's uh, a guy that I've been in touch with for, for a few years. His name is William Ingdahl. I consider him to be a very, very top-level researcher. He lives in Germany. He's the author of a book called The Seeds of Destruction, which tells the real story of genetic engineering and how it was actually basically financed by the Rockefellers as a, a, a weapon of depopulation. But when people go, Jeff, who, but who would do this stuff? He has a chapter in there called The Brotherhood of Death. And I've got excerpts from this chapter on my Rachel's Carson of Today website. Uh, it's, under the, uh, it's under the first month of posting there. But go and check that out. He talks about all these people that were actually paid to come up with ways to deviously kill people. And uh, you mentioned that the Tuscan CG syphilis thing, mm -hmm. where they gave, they gave syphilis to, to like black people 
without them knowing it and then study them to see what it did. I mean, they've done millions of experiments like that. There's a, a woman named Eileen Simmons that wrote a book about how they, they gave plutonium injections to all these people and then studied how they lived over the next few decades. There's a guy named Cornelius Rhodes who was this, he was just like, I mean, you, you, can, you can use the word Nazi to describe what this guy did. I mean, but, but, because it's really the same thing. Uh, um, he actually injected, he gave cancer to all these sort of minority people. He, was, he had a, a lab in Puerto Rico, I think, and uh, all this absolutely diabolical shit. And, uh, and then, but then when it became more well-known what he was doing, in, instead of him getting in trouble, he, he, he got promoted. He got uh, hired by the Atomic Energy Commission, and they gave him his own research laboratory to continue his own work. Uh, using uh, he became involved with the Manhattan Project or something like that, the AEC. So, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. And, and when when you're talking about that, the vast majority of people will do anything for the right amount of money. And the fact that all these people, these are the people that invented money. They don't just control it; they invented it, and they know the whole concept of money is a hoax. It's all designed to control people with something that's fake. And now they're pulling the plug on the whole system. And I think that there's a really serious move to, uh, to get rid of cash and replace it with electronic money that's only going to exist in your microchip that, that, that they're going to want to put in your body. And there's many people that share that also and feel that that's where this is heading Yes, but but in the beginning it'll be voluntary. Like you're gonna you're gonna actually want your microchip because it's gonna be very convenient. And what scares me is when you go around and see how many people have their smartphones in their hand and they can't put the stupid things down. It's like they're locked into it. It's absolutely fucking insane. I've been going around Melbourne a lot lately. Uh, I'm actually stunned to see the behavior of people with these things. And so th those people, the people that have to have their iPhone or their smartphone on all the time and their headphones and shit, they're not going to have any problem making the next little leap to the microchip that's going to have all that shit in it, and it'll just be in their body. I really don't think those people are going to have a problem with it. But the microchips, I mean, it's already known that they cause cancer. It's going to cause cancer. It's, it's going to start as soon as you put it in you. It's, I mean, it's just, it's, beyond, it's like the most diabolical nightmare that you can imagine, the stuff that we're gradually allowing to happen and we're all sitting here we can't say that someone else is doing it because we're all participants and observers in this whole process uh, to different degrees um, it's quite terrifying quite terrifying to see all this stuff happening and uh, the nuclear scenario to me okay another <laughs> global warming I mean who could actually believe that that's happening just because there's heat waves somewhere doesn't mean that the whole planet's warming. There's a lot of places that are, that are actually colder. I mean, it, logically as a concept, uh, and I've actually found a very advanced scientific article from the Niels Bohr Institute that backs up what I'm saying right now. The whole concept of saying that a planet can have a temperature is absurd. It's, meaning, it's a meaningless concept to say that a planet has a temperature. The Earth has many different temperatures at any given time, many. It, in one day, the same place has many different temperatures. And so the whole concept of an average temperature is meaningless. You can't – plus, what they call global warming, if, if, you look, if you look at a list of what HARP does in terms of what – its basic mode of operation is that it injects massive amounts of energy into the ionosphere. So it, it adds heat. So HARP can actually create all the effects attributed to global warming. So that's, that's a really big hoax. Um, carbon dioxide is not a poison. Repeat, not a poison. Carbon dioxide is a nutrient for plants. Carbon dioxide fuels the largest biological process on this planet, which is photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, all life as we know it except for anaerobic bacteria would come to a halt. So carb the, the war against carbon is a war against life. That's what it's all about. So are, are you getting ready to take a break here in a minute? 
Well, I'm actually, we're, we're getting close to the end of the show, and I wanted to make sure that you shared how people can find your, your blogs and your information on the Internet. Well, it's gone by that fast. Yes. I'm yes, sorry did. I talked so much. I didn't give oh, you a no, chance. Oh, no, that's what you were here for. Oh, my God. Well, um, I've got several blogs. If you go to our main website, you can see a list of links. I'll tell you that first. It's uh, http colon slash slash dolphinmatrix.com stroke Jeff, and it's all one word, lowercase, D-O-L-P-H-I-N-M-A-T-R-I-X dot com slash, and then capital J, and then lowercase E-F-F. That'll take you to our main site where you can see our artwork and watch two of our films. We're working on a major beyond film about the whales and dolphins, about who they are as fellow beings, and also what the real threats to them are, which is not anyone in Japan whaling or fishing, but it's from military industrial activity like seismic testing, naval sonar, and the contamination of the Pacific Ocean by all these radionuclides from Fukushima. There's close to 2,000 synthetic radionuclides that exist. We only hear about a handful, and each one of them has its own decay chain and daughter products that come out, and each, sometimes the daughter products can be more radioactive than the parent. So when you're talking about ionizing radiation, we're talking about probably tens of thousands of different substances, and who can map that? When you do a test for radioactive substances, they just look for one or two at a time. You know, um, it's absolutely insane. The work of Dr. Rosalie Bertel, who died a few months ago, she's, an, she's a major hero of all things nuclear. Um, I've got a blog called geo-terrorism.blogspot.com and Rachel's Carson of today and um, Tutanui-Wananga is my d blog about the whales and dolphins. Okay, 60 seconds. We, we appreciate all the information that you shared with us today and all the work that you put in to these blogs. And I think I, I told you yesterday, the first time I came across Rachel Carlson blog, I almost cried. It, it was just, it's, um, um, you did such a wonderful job putting this information together and showing how it can affect us as a planet and a people. Well, and Rachel Carson said, uh, she said that there, she's one of my biggest heroes. She said that there is, there is no safe level of a carcinogen or a mutagen, no safe level, and that genetic toxicologists say that we have to study 25 generations of people before we can even begin to say whether it's safe or not. We're only the third generation since all this stuff came into being. Well, stay on the line, Jeff, because I want to talk to you um, when okay. the show is over. I'll be uploading a bedtime nuclear story tonight to YouTube, and I had some great people that you guys all know help me out with this and read. So until Thursday, stay safe. Keep your eyes on the nuke plants on the East Coast who are continuing to have problems, and now Fitzpatrick has been put on that list as well. In fact, keep your eyes on all the nuke plants, Japan and everywhere. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. In a nuclear attack on this country, one of the greatest threats would be radioactive fallout. While heat and blast effects of even the largest bombs would have a definite limit, any area could be threatened by fallout. The large number of weapons which probably would be dropped in a full-scale attack would produce fallout, ranging from light to intense, over much of the nation. <laughs>